Let us bow our heads. God, we thank thee and we praise thee for thy love, thy peace. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this church. Thank you, God, for saving us. Now, God, we ask that your word might be open to us, that we might live and that we might work as you've taught us, as you've led us, as you've given us Christ as our example, as you've given us the Holy Spirit, which indwells us. And so we thank you today, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And we ask that you continue to lead us by your power. In Christ's name, amen. I'm thankful to God for worship. Thankful. Thankful for our scriptures, for our prayers, our musician, for Brandon, our soloist. God is so good to us. Sister Lisa, it's good just to be able to worship God. And if you know God, it don't take much to worship. If you just think about how good God has been to us. I asked Brandon to sing that song again because it truly is day after day. I mean, the mercy that the Lord shows us is day after day. There's some folk that show you some mercy yesterday, but they're not going to give you none today. But the Lord, he shows us mercy every day, and we all be thankful for that. Our lectionary scriptures really embody that this morning, Brother Thomas. This whole idea of God being with us every day. It's interesting that you can look into the scriptures and you see how they connect. And they all connect at Christ. And in our daily life, we live those cycles that the text so wonderfully puts together for us. Because Christ indeed died. And I know that for many of us, that's one event. But if we really think about it, it is a daily event. For each of us, each day has to take up the cross to follow Christ. Yes. He doesn't just say to follow without the cross. The cross is necessary to follow Christ. Just as our baptism is necessary to follow Christ, the cross is necessary to follow Christ. But, but Sister Lisa, that's something that we don't want to do. Who wants to carry the cross? That's not something that you want to do. Maybe a job that even you choose, that you choose to accept, but not something that you want to do. Even Christ says, let this bitter cup pass from me. The job that was to be done at Calvary. And yet, each and every Christian is admonished and challenged to follow Christ. We say we follow Christ in our words, but oftentimes not in our deeds. And to fully follow Christ, one must also take up the cross. There is a challenge in following Christ. Yeah. And so I fear that as we move forward, that, that, that we are once again in those very prophetic times that we can find within the text of the Bible. I don't think that we're going to last for thousands of more years, but if we do, this period would be one that I believe people will later go back to and find out what the faithful were doing. Because this is a period of time that is very challenging to one's faith. It is challenging to one's tradition and the way that we understand the doctrine of the text. There, there are thoughts and theological differences in denominations. There are all kinds of things going on. And sometimes there's some pain involved in that that metamorphosis there's some pain that's involved that, that that's involved in rising from the dead there's some pain at the crucifix there's some there's some distrust and some some wonder with regards to the tomb now maybe because you've been a christian so long that doesn't sound that doesn't sound did he say distrust there's some distrust with the tomb let's be honest before he came out of the tomb many of them thought that was it so there's some distrust at the tomb. And there's always in each and every one of our days a little bit of distrust that goes with our faith. 
None of us at 100% yet. And we're always working at that deficit of trust and distrust, moving through carrying the cross, moving through the whole, the whole idea of what crucifix and resurrection is. If we can understand that as Christians, then we can understand how this moves us forward in our journey. Because if you've noticed, since we've come back from our recess, if you will, but since we've come back from virtual worship, one of the things that the Lord has really been leading us to talk about is this whole idea of grace and how we are still connected in spite of our long separation. We're still connected in spite of our long separation. We're still connected in spite of the journey. And there will be times in the life of the Christian, in the life of the church, where we will have those crucifying moments. Those moments where we have to take our faith to the cross. Those moments where our faith goes to the tomb. Those moments where we're a little bit doubtful. But then as we study the text, as we ingest God's word, then Brother Jay Sean, we should be coming stronger every single day to rise from the experience of the cross, to rise from the experience of the tomb. But Sister Thomas, we should never forget it. This is part of the problem in America today, is the whole idea of rising above but forgetting one's tomb. He says, take up the cross and follow me. Notice that he does not say, Deacon uh, David Hodge, take the tomb and follow me. He doesn't say, take resurrection and follow me. He says, take the cross and follow me. And so he gives us instruction in terms of how to follow. And so our greatest memory, as he says, do this in memory of me with regards to our communion together, should still be the cross. The idea of the cross is to give up oneself in order to incorporate everybody into the family. Now, family business is messy business. Oh, some of y'all must not belong to families. <laughs> family business is messy business. It's messy. Brothers and sisters don't get along. Mama and kids don't get along. It's all kinds of things that happen in families. And then sometimes they love each other. Sometimes they love to hate each other. But family business can be some very messy business. And to really be in family, sometimes you got to take up that cross, okay? Sometimes to really follow Christ, you got to make some sacrifices and bend and, and do some things that sometimes you don't feel comfortable doing. But as I said, the founding pastors, I said once before, founding pastors of this church used to say the one with the most sense needs to stop. So in times of conflict, when you want to know who needs to settle it, the one that feels the most Christian, stop. And let love settle the family so that we might move forward. Today's text, Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21, shows us one of these family struggles. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abram or Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast this bondwoman and her son, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abram's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it in, putting it on her shoulder and the child and set her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and set her down over against him a good way off as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. 
and she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, what aileth thee Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink and God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and he became an archer and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt still in the family still in the family over the past couple of weeks or a few weeks as I said You've heard me explore and we've talked about the scriptures that, that really embrace us with regards to this gripping grace. As the Holy Spirit has been our guide and has led us as grace has amplified God's and the Lord's lingering love for each and every one of us. We're privileged, Deacon Arnetta Hodge, to be a part of God's family. That is a privilege. Romans 8 verses 14, 17 says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also Glory, be also glorified together. And so we are members of the family of God. We are family together. Nevertheless, some of us would rather identify with the prodigal son's brother in Luke chapter 15. We're happy when we're living as an only child while another sibling is separated from the family. All too sad to want all of the privilege and all of the blessings of the father for yourself. Our God has enough for you and thousands more. There's room yet at the cross for you. Throw out the lifeline across the dark way. There is a brother that someone should save. Somebody's brother, oh, who would then dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share? To throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. The 21st chapter of Genesis reminds us that family drama and dysfunction is not new. Nothing new about family drama, all right? And disastrously here in this 21st chapter, we find two women living with one man. We find two women, both mothering a child by the same man. Things had become a little too close for comfort, if you will. Tension emerged and superiority complexes grew over the terms of pregnancy. Abraham's wife had been friendly with the other woman at first. The handmaid then started to make some demands and her child seemed to be mocking and so on and so forth. And ultimately, Sarah has a child of her own and is ready for Hagar, the handmaid, the bondwoman and her child to be evicted from the family. It was time for an extraction. I wonder, has anybody ever been subject to a family extraction? Anybody ever been ejected from somewhere or, or, or put out? You've been tossed out of the club because you didn't fit in. Hurts, doesn't it, when you one day you're a part of the in crowd and the next day, Sister Dominic Hodge, you're just nothing but the outcast. That hurts when they accept you one day and they don't like you the next when your circumstances throw you out of the club. Your poverty throws you out of the club. Your mama and your daddy throw you out of the club. You throw it out because you're not like the rest of us. Put out because you're different, ejected because of your illegitimate or questionable past. I wonder, is there anybody here with a questionable or illegitimate past? Is there a witness here of anybody that ever did anything you were embarrassed by? Thought maybe they were going to throw you out of the club, but God has kept you in the family. The bond woman and Hagar's boy said they wanted Ishmael out 
Sarah didn't want him there no more. It's time for him to go. The circumstances of his birth put him out. Yes, just based on who his mama was. There are times when folks are mad at you because of who you related to. It's folk bothered at you because they know something about your family. People bothered because of who your friends might be. Transfer issues, I call them. This boy was disadvantaged nearly from the very start. He was disadvantaged like some of our young people who are living in poverty today. Disadvantaged not because of anything you uh, 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 do per se, but because of the circumstance of your environment. Many of our young people are living uh, because they have the wrong pedigree. They've been pushed off to the dry lands like this child, disregarded and, and put away. The enemy means to uh, cause us to divide our families and to divide our church. Look at the state of the church today, and I mean the church universal church how divided the church is and how oftentimes we uh, struggle even to talk about membership these days it's not a, a liberty hill issue it is a global kind of issue and it's precisely because the enemy's way is to divide us and sift us as we and part of our division is over petty little ideas and ideologies on the text when we can get back uh, to what jesus said and really simplify some things and move forward and if we are really honest, a lot of times, part of what we are bothered about has to do with other people's business and not our business. I fear that many of us will miss being in the family ourselves while so busy trying to push others out. The Lord can keep us in the family when the world seeks to divide us. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. You've heard it before. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in spite of all the negative forces that seek to strip you from the hands of God, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We're still in the family. God still loves you and loves us. We're fixed within the family of God. The Lord cares for us and cares about us. And just as Ishmael was still in the family, we are in the family. Far too often we want to kick those out who are not like us. It is important that we hold each other accountable, but it is also important that we remember that God's joy is to find the family together. We should sincerely seek to, to spread the gospel and share the gospel with our entire family. This is not a meal that is supposed to be private. This is a meal that is supposed to invite the world. Whosoever will, let them come. As we think about it, uh, they were thinking there in this text, they were thinking about themselves. But it's only when we think about others that we're truly able to share the gospel. Because what we should seek to do is not cut each other, but our jack cure each other with love. But then look at the text today, verses 10 through 13. It says, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For if Isaac, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called, and also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. In verse 13 again it says, And also... Of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is I see. And also kept him in the family. All right. 
<laughs> and also, see, some people feel entitled. They, they, they don't eat leftovers. They don't wear hand-me-downs. They get, you know, I'm entitled. I'm too good for God's ladder reign. I, 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 don't, I don't want God's ladder reign. But let me tell you something. I take what God give me. I, I take what I can get. You know, there was a woman in Matthew chapter 15 who uh, wanted her daughter to be healed, you know, and, and there was a conversation between her and Jesus, and ultimately she said to, to Jesus that even the crumbs from the table, the dogs even get the crumbs from the table. Sometimes we've got to just be thankful that God has given us something, but anything that God has given us is a blessing. We, we ought to be thankful because we, we know that if God is doing something, uh, 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 like uh, Paul Martin, we don't want him to do it without us. Whatever God is doing, please, Lord, include us. I'm good with being the afterthought. I'm good with the latter rain. I'm good with the late bloom. It's okay to be the black sheep as long as you're God's black sheep. See, when the Lord takes care of you, you don't have to worry about it. And so it was the end also. The, the text was talking, if you notice there, uh, in the prior verses, it was focused on Abraham, Sarah, and their conversation, their desires. The, 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 the lad wasn't really taken into consideration. The, the mother wasn't taken into consideration. Nobody was really talking uh, uh, for them. They were talking more about them. Guidelines were given in terms of how to extract them from the family and so on and so forth. And uh, up until now, nothing is said. But then all of a sudden, Deacon David Hodge in verse 13, it says, and also. And it was that all and also that redirects the attention to the son. Uh, aren't you glad that there was a man also out there on the cross that redirected the attention to us? Because he didn't come for us. He came for those that were chosen. And yet God loves us so much that he included us in the family. It's okay to be in the latter rain as long as you are a part of what God is doing. Finally, this redirection gives us this hope, this joy to know that this boy also will have something going on for him. I wonder, is there anybody hoping for some child today? Hoping that something will get better. But don't you know that God can provide her and also? Things may not look like you want them to look today. Maybe it looks like you're not going to get the blessing of Abraham. But just hold on because there is an and also in the spirit that can give you your blessing as well. Thank God for adding you to the order. Thank God that you've been added to that number. We're not outdoors because God has loved us so much. He says, and also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation. God's plan, his nation plan, kept Ishmael in the family and also kept him in. But then God's nation plan keeps him in the family. As God promises to make Ishmael a nation drawn together by God's love, God doesn't separate us. He pulls us together. He says, I'm going to make a nation out of them too. God cares for us. God cares for family. God cares for some connection between us. And so God wants us to live so that we might be able to bless all nations, to teach all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we're following after the Son, Jesus the Christ. We've been created by the Father. We're filled by the Son, by, by the Holy Spirit, and we're following the Son. God is there with us all the time, loving us because we're in the family in the family so much so till God allowed Jesus to die for us. We're a holy nation, a family of God. We're still in the family because of God's nation plan. The church is one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. We are a new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and taught us what perfect love can do. The love and death he sought us and rose to set us free. Church in every nation is one through all the earth. Our charter is salvation. One God, one faith, one birth. One name together blessing. One holy food we share. To one hope ever pressing. At one in work and prayer. But then again in verse 13 it says. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation. Because he is thy seed. Ishmael is still in the family because and also he's 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 in the family because God has a nation plan. 
but he's also still in the family because of the seed. John uh, chapter 10 verses 29 through or 27 through 29 says this my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand now I won't go too deep into it Reverend Haynes but I know you know what I'm getting ready to say you see, uh, some of our brothers and sisters in the faith believe in this whole idea that you can be saved tomorrow, today and lost tomorrow. But you see, uh, we understand it doctrinally and scripturally that the text tells us that what's in God's hand, you can't take out of God's hand. Oh, I wish somebody would understand this today. Because see, there are some people who want to take you out of the family and put you back in the family and take you out of the family based on how you act. But I want you to know that no matter how you act, your righteousness is but filthy rags. The only thing that saves us is the fact that the Holy Spirit is in us, that God has given Jesus' blood to die. He died and his blood was shed to cleanse us from our sins. It is only through Jesus and our faith that we are saved. Our actions are changed as a result of our faith, not our actions and then our faith. See, there's a whole lot of good people out there that don't believe in Jesus. There's a whole lot of folk who give away money and who take care of the poor, but they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Salvation is about our belief and our trust, our faith in God through Jesus. We've got to have the Holy Spirit in us, and once we're regenerated into the Holy Family, once we're in God's hands, then nothing could ever pluck us out. You're in the family of God. See, okay. Y'all used to watch uh, Tyson fight, didn't you? Yeah, watch Tyson fight. He bad dude. And he won a whole lot of, lot of battles. But that last one, he didn't win. With, uh, with Douglas, he didn't win. That one, then the one with Holyfield, he had to bite him. But you realize that today, and as time goes on, the more he gets older and older and older, and the more time that goes by, the less he'll be able to fight. See, uh, the more time goes on, the less he'll be able to fight. Last time we seen Muhammad Ali, he couldn't have, probably couldn't have got a fly if he wanted to. As strong as he had been. As strong as every man is in this room. The reason that we oftentimes think of things being taken from us is because your hands can't hold on to nothing. But God's hands. We're not talking about Tyson's hands. We're not talking about holy fear. We're not talking about man's hand. We're talking about God's hand. We're talking about the all-powerful, the one that stepped out into nothing and created everything. We're talking about the one that scooped up the dust and formed us. We're talking the one that breathed air into our breath and we became living beings. We're talking about that God, the one that has enough power that if he reached down and grabbed you, what's in God's hand, who could take it out? No man's arms are long enough to box with God. God's word does not come back void. Ishmael was in the family because there was a covenant on the seed. God said that I'm blessing it and when God blesses, nothing you can do. Isaiah 55, 9 through 11 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. When God blesses something, what God says, God's word is true. God had blessed the seed. And even though there seemed to be a, a, what I would think of as a hiccup by man, God still keeps God's word. 
We can't even mess up God's word. The Lord will never leave or forsake us according to Deuteronomy chapter 13, 31. He will never leave us nor forsake us. We've got to trust and depend on God. But not only should we, we can. Because God can keep us in the family. The word of God is like a germinating seed that brings life to the heart of the believer. We're blessed to be in the family by the seed, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. In the family because God says we are. You can be rejected from the village, but they can't take you off the voyage. Right. God has got you and you are in the family. You are loved. You are cared for. We're blessed through the seed of David by Jesus, the first fruit of humanity. God loves us. But then look at verses 14 through 16. It says this. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar. Put it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. She departed, wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba, and the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and set her down over against him a good way off. And it was a bow shot, for she said, let, not, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. His mother kept him in the family. She did all she could, Aunt Jack. She did all she knew to do. She was wandering around uh, Thomas' family. She was wandering around the desert like a lot of the young mothers are doing today. It's a lot of young mothers who've been set out there with a very little resources by themselves. Set out there to fend by themselves. Resource deficient, just aimlessly wandering. Not fully understanding what to do? How many times do we see our young people struggling to raise children? But she did what she could do until all she could do was weep. Partly where we are in America today because mothers are doing all they can do with their children and some are still having to weep at prison gates. All you can do, and yet this society with abject poverty continues to push some children down while disproportionately raising others. Poverty, as it branches itself out throughout our country, we can realize that there are many mothers who find themselves in this mother's shape, in her condition, pushed out. And oftentimes we talk about the resource, the physical resource here that has been spent. The water has been spent and so on and so forth. But what about the emotional resource? How this woman must have felt to have been pushed out without any protection, without family. Just her and a baby boy. Wow. Feed them. Clothe them, nurture them, take them off to school, and still find that your child is at death's doorstep. Now, some may not look at this as something that has to do with infant mortality, and yet that's a problem in our country and certainly in Franklin County. But there are some of our kids, and I, maybe you don't agree, but Pastor uh, Montrell, I'm going to tell you, there's some of our kids that are like the walking dead. There's some of our kids that we know are on the verge of a spiritual and mental breakdown. Some have already been broke down. And what have we done? We've often done single parents and single mothers. We've left them out there to fend for themselves. Oh, it's her fault. And what happens, she becomes detached from family, detached from the church because, you know, you didn't do it right. Then destitute. Then the children are destitute. Everybody's hungry. Everybody's thirsty. And then they show up at your house. But they weren't invited. They came through the window. They came through the locked door because 
We've pushed them aside. And then as they get pushed aside with the mental and emotional issues that they're dealing with, oftentimes they deal with life through denial. Which is what many of us do. What did she say? I don't want to see him die. I know that he's about to perish, but I don't want to see it. How many of us fat cat black folk don't want to see what's happening in the world today? How many fat cat rich white folk don't want to see what's happening in the world today? It's okay as long as I don't see it. I know there's calamity at the border and I know that there's starving children at the end of my block and I know that there's another paradigm on the other side of the railroad track but as long as I don't see it, build a freeway over it, take me around it, get me from the airport to downtown without seeing them poor folk, I don't want to see it. And so she said, oh, she didn't want to see it. Don't turn the news on because it's too, it's too depressing. I don't want to see another black child shot. I don't want to see another black man suffocated on the street. I don't want to see it. She said, set me afar off because I don't want to see it. Church, we got to learn how to do what we can while we can. We got to learn how to allow God to open our eyes because if we allow God to do it, there is a well, there is a well, there is a well. It's dug just for you. God will provide if we but turn our attention toward the Lord. She did all she could do until all she could do was weep. But I've often said to a lot of our women and, and, and some of our men, but I, I mostly say it to our women and no disrespect, but you know, a lot of mamas is loud. Mama, sometimes you're too loud. Sometimes uh, all that noise and all that hollering at them children ain't doing a thing. Probably messing up their hearing and messing up your throat. Because the text tells us that she got loud. The text tells us that she wept. But it was the kid that God heard. It was the kid. It was the kid that God heard. He was in the family because of his mama. But then last but certainly not least, he was in the family because of God. Because yes, she cried for him. His daddy was concerned about him. Said that his spirit was bothered, so to speak. He gave her a bottle of water. Put the child on her shoulder. See you later. That was father's contribution. The mama carried him around for a little while and, and you know, gave him some water until she had no more resources. Then she did what many of us do. She, she cried, she wept, but that was all she could do. But then God steps in. God steps in because he hears the lad. He hears the boy. And so I stopped by just for uh, these few moments this morning to remind you that God hears your faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. Doesn't matter if you come from some shady, illegitimate, gray background, or maybe your past isn't squeaky clean. God still loves you, and you still in the family. Somebody told you that you don't belong. You're too fat. You're too black. You're too thin. You're too white. You're too whatever. But God says you're in the family. Jesus died to keep you in the family. You're in the family. God loves you. God loves me. God loves us. You are in the family. The blood of Christ has been shed so that you might be in the family. Propitiation has been made. That we might walk together. That we might understand that true sentiment of not separating wheat and chaff. We are together to love each other no matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if you Isaac or Ishmael. We're all the sons of Abraham. We're all the children of God. And for that we should be glad. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lifted me and what his grace can do. Saved by his power divine, saved by new power sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. I'm saved, saved, saved. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. 